Want to play a game? Can you count how many technical gadgets you use during your day? Don't forget to count your router, lint remover, and every light bulb. Well, five, seven, maybe 15? Studies claim that the average household in the USA currently owns around 25 electronic devices. In 2019, this number was more than half lower. The modern speed of life makes it so easy to forget that our everyday essentials have history. Let's do some time travel to refresh our memory. Chances are you'll never take your toilet paper for granted again. You wake up to the annoying sound of an alarm clock. This is how it looked like 1,000 years ago. Just kidding, it's a rooster. These birds did a great job helping people wake up at dawn before an American named Levi Hutchins invented the first alarm clock in 1787. But this device could only ring at 4 a.m. It took mankind 60 more years to create a technology allowing us to set the alarm time manually and around 170 more years to invent an alarm that wakes you up with your favorite aromas. And now it's time to brush your teeth. Which toothbrush would you rather choose? The first one is actually a vintage shoe brush. You should probably choose this sophisticated gold-plated tool. In fact, it's a toothbrush made for Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte between 1790 and 1821. But of course, people realized that their teeth needed care much earlier. Ancient Egyptians used branches with frayed ends to rub against their teeth. And the first bristle toothbrushes date back to 1498. Chinese craftsmen manufactured bristles from hog hairs. 360 years later, in 1857, American inventor H.N. Wadsworth patented the prototype of the modern toothbrush. And the first electric toothbrushes popped up in stores in 1960. You've just washed your hair. Time to do some styling. Would you risk putting your head inside this vintage hair dryer? A stationary hair dryer was invented in 1890 in France. Although it looks pretty claustrophobic, it was very popular in beauty salons before the era of portable hair dryers came over. Let's move on to the toilet. How about using a stone instead of toilet paper? In ancient times, people chose various materials to clean up, including leaves, grass, animal furs, water, seashells, and even stones. Rumor has it that ancient Greeks preferred using ceramics with their enemies' names. And in 1857, an American named Joseph Gaetti first marketed the modern toilet paper. He called it simply, medicated paper for the water closet. The paper was sold in packages of 500 sheets for 50 cents, which is worth $17 in today's money. And this is what your flush toilet would look like if you lived in 1592. Sir John Harrington, godson of Elizabeth I, created this masterpiece in England. It's basically a water closet with a raised cistern and a small downpipe through which water runs and flushes the waste. Time to cook some breakfast. These old kitchen stoves are no more than wood-burning cook stoves. But as the age of invention took place, stoves evolved to fit modern homes. Gas stoves first appeared in 1826, and in 100 years, they were used in most domestic kitchens. And now, let's boil some water to make tea. Before the 19th century, most kettles were made of iron. People placed them directly on the flame. That's why such kettles needed constant cleaning. Mesopotamian tea lovers made their kettles from bronze, and it took an effort to make all these sophisticated decorations. But the first electric kettle appeared only in 1891 in the USA. It took about 12 minutes to boil water because the water and the heating elements were placed in separate chambers. Luckily, the modern kettles do it in a blink of an eye. Well, now, can you guess what this device is for? Nope, it's not a sewing machine. It's an electric toaster. This is what it looked like in 1893 when it was first invented in Scotland. Nowadays, toasters look more aesthetically pleasing and take less space. Speaking of space, the first hard disk was the size of a cupboard and its storage was only 5 megabytes. But today, we have 32 gigabyte disks that are used in cameras and mobile phones. 
Just imagine how much information you could fit in a cupboard if you could fill it fully with such discs. The correct answer is a lot. Your friend is calling. Pick up the phone. But get straight to the point. It only has about 20 minutes of battery life. This massive tool is the world's first mobile phone made by Motorola in 1973. It weighs 2.5 pounds and costs $4,000, which is around $27,000 in today's money. Time to get dressed for work. Would you risk ironing your crispy white shirt with such a device? Well, people used to take that risk before inventing the first electric iron in 1882. And this cute creature is an antique gas-powered iron made at the beginning of the 20th century. Earlier, they just put coal in the iron to heat it up. Is it too sunny outdoors? No problem. Put on this stylish accessory. Snow goggles were invented centuries ago to protect eyes from snow blindness. And this simple item has eventually evolved into sunglasses that we use today to hide from UV light. Why is everything so blurry? Did you forget to put on your contact lenses? Today, over 150 million people worldwide use them on a daily basis. But the first guy to get this brilliant idea lived in the 16th century, and his name was Leonardo da Vinci. In 1508, he described a method of directly affecting the cornea by putting the head in a bowl of water or just wearing a water-filled glass hemisphere over the eyes. But it took people around 400 years to bring that idea to light. And meanwhile, humankind used eyeglasses. The ancient ones used to have lenses made out of quartz and metal frames. Of course, their design was too heavy to be considered fashionable. But thankfully, today we enjoy a wide variety of frames in different styles and designs with glass or plastic lenses. It's time to hit the road. Would you mind riding this bike? That's right, it doesn't have any pedals. First bicycles didn't have a saddle, a braking mechanism, or pedals. That's why people simply called it the running machine. Also, manufacturers offered models with a bigger front wheel for higher speeds. Thankfully, speed and comfort characteristics evolved over time and continue to do so today. Take a look at this amazing rainbow. We got to take a picture immediately. Unfortunately, 40 years ago, this photo would have looked something like this. No color, no clarity. It was the time when digital cameras had just appeared. They weighed 9 pounds and they could only take black and white images. But the progress is impressive. Today, it takes just one click to make a high-resolution picture or video on your phone. Finally, you arrive at the office and see this mysterious device. Can you recognize its purpose? It's an old-school printer. The first printing devices appeared in the 15th century in Europe, and they were way bigger and heavier than the modern ones that we use in offices and homes. Your shirt got dirty after a long day at work. Which machine would you rather choose to wash it? The right device is a wiser choice because it's electric. The left washing machine can wash up to 10 shirts, but it's only operated with a hand crank. Someone has spilled popcorn on the floor. Let's clean this up. But can you guess which of these two devices is the real vacuum cleaner? The left one. The right device is a vintage lawnmower. The first vacuum cleaners appeared in 1901, and they were petrol driven. It took a while for this device to evolve into a vacuum cleaner robot free of any tubes and wires. Just take a look at these two pictures. These devices don't even look like they're from the same planet. We all spend about 30 minutes in the bathroom every day. But just because we use a lot of personal care items to make sure we look and feel our best, doesn't mean these things should be stored in the bathroom. To start off, that includes bar soap. Keeping your soap near the direct stream of your shower can shorten its shelf life. Water will break your bar soap down, and the residue will build up in your bath. The best way to store your soap is to keep it on a soap dish with holes that let it dry outside of the shower. Razors Shower steam and the buildup of humidity can rust the blades, which, in turn, can damage your skin. 
Even if you properly clean and dry it off after using, storing it in a humid bathroom environment will shorten the lifespan of your razor. Towels Keeping your used damp towels in the bathroom can be a recipe for grossness. (laughs) Warmth and humidity make bathrooms the perfect breeding ground for bacteria, and towels will pick up germs that will later transfer to our skin. Ideally, you should wash your towels after three uses and allow them to dry completely before they're used again. Your bathrobe Much like bath towels, damp robes can harbor germs and bacteria, and humidity can give them an unpleasant smell. If you're putting on a damp bathrobe right after showering, you can consider your shower pretty much pointless. Instead of keeping your bathrobe on a hook in your bathroom, hang it in a place where it can air dry. Your phone Now, it's not the best idea to use your phone while on the toilet, and taking your phone into the bathroom isn't safe either. Scrolling through your feed while soaking in the tub may be dangerous. And if you need your tunes while you shower, don't keep your phone on the counter. The steam from the shower can get inside and ruin its internal parts. If you just can't go without music while scrubbing down, it's worth investing in a waterproof speaker. Face creams When your skin cream isn't tightly closed or sealed, the damp air in the bathroom can encourage bacteria to grow. Those bacteria can cause skin irritation and ruin your complexion. Plus, every time you take a hot shower, the heat can cause the ingredients to separate. The perfect place to store your skincare products is a dry drawer outside of the bathroom or in the fridge. That's why they call it cold cream. (laughs) Makeup brushes It's important to clean your brushes regularly and to properly dry them afterward to avoid bacterial growth. But once you're done washing your brushes, it's best to store them in a dry place, standing brush side up in a cup. Warm and humid air in the bathroom encourages mold and bacteria to spread on them. And just like your toothbrush, they will pick up germs that you will later smear right on your skin. Perfume Storing your fragrances in a bathroom can break down their molecular structure and cause them to sour. To keep your favorite perfume fresh for longer, look for a closet or cupboard outside the bathroom to store it in. Jewelry The bathroom isn't the right place to keep your jewelry, even if you just take it off before stepping into the shower. The humid environment will make the jewelry oxidize faster, causing it to lose shine and tarnish. Unless it is pure gold, your favorite pieces that are composed of different metals will react faster in humidity. Toothbrushes When you flush the toilet with the lid up, germs can spread up to 15 feet, and bacteria will most likely get sprayed all over your toothbrush. Dentists recommend keeping your toothbrush as far away as possible from the toilet, in a place where it can dry completely. The best place is covered, like in your bathroom closet or a medicine cabinet. And forget about those little plastic covers for your toothbrush. Yep, they encourage bacterial growth in that little cramped space in a humid environment. Okie dokie, are you grossed out yet? Yeah, me too. So, now you know what to do. Fitness trackers and fancy smartwatches are fine for monitoring your heart rate and even the miles you cover on a run. They're not so good at measuring the number of calories you've burned, though. A 2017 study from the Stanford University School of Medicine showed that fitness trackers and smartwatches have error margins of less than 5% when it comes to measuring heart rates. That's pretty good, so you can be confident in whatever reading you're getting. The problem is with the devices measuring energy expenditure accurately or calendars burn. Even the best was off by an average of 27%. The worst was off by a crazy 93%. That means they're very unreliable and shouldn't be trusted. Fitness trackers don't work well for measuring calories because we all have different heights, weights, diets, and many other things. That means we all burn calories at completely different rates. The trackers are often programmed with a preset average height and weight. So, if you're going to use one, take it with a grain of salt. Unless you're trying to reduce your sodium intake. Sunscreens have only one job to do, and that's protecting us from the harmful ultraviolet rays. In 2017, though, a study found that many popular brands failed to protect at all, with only one in four working. Most sunscreens didn't protect users from ultraviolet A and B rays at all. 
Some manufacturers also claim that these products had an SPF of over 50, which sounds very high quality. But the actual SPF was much lower than that. The misleading labeling means we aren't as protected as we think when we're at the beach. So when you're out shopping for sunscreen, make sure you look at the ingredients and apply more than you think you should. Ooh, sports drinks, an essential item for anyone working out. These bright-colored drinks are filled with electrolytes that will increase your performance and rehydrate you fast. The problem is, we're not all athletes, so most people would be better if they just drink water instead. Sports drinks are made up of water with some minerals and lots of sugar, coloring, and flavor. Those minerals are electrolytes, which can help our bodies go longer. Your exercise habits, the duration, and the intensity of your training all come into whether you really need that extra boost. While sports drinks can benefit athletes engaged in long or intense training, they're not really necessary for most gym goers. Sports drinks are probably pointless if you're only doing light to moderate exercise, like walking or jogging, over a short period of time. After using a toaster for most of your life, most people still haven't figured out how to get a perfect heat setting. It turns out that burnt toast is probably just down to a simple misconception. Those numbers on your toaster aren't heat levels at all. They're actually minutes. The dial is basically just a timer. That means all you need to do is look up how long it takes to toast certain things, and you'll never ruin your breakfast again. Hey, I like burnt toast. (laughs) I'm used to it. Most of us rely on wireless technology to carry out normal, everyday tasks. It can be very frustrating when technology stops working and interrupts your day. In fact, the only thing more frustrating might be not knowing why it isn't working. The worst culprit here is your cell phone. It'll often show really great reception, but somehow can't make a phone call. The bars on a cell phone actually don't mean anything. The way they receive the signal differs a lot between different makes and models of phone. There's even a big difference between what the bars mean from one phone to another. Meanwhile, watching a progress bar showing the percentage of time left to complete a download on our phones or PC can be tedious. Sometimes they just seem to be stuck doing nothing. Bad news, they don't really work. At least not in the way we think. The system updates the progress bar when certain milestones are reached. A progress bar at 50% doesn't mean half the file has been downloaded. Almost all the files could have been downloaded. The point of them is to give you something visual to look at. Progress bars aren't accurate because downloads and transfers have too many variables beyond the system's control. Internet speeds and network availability are the coordinators of how quickly a download will complete, while your computer's hard drive determines how fast things process and information gets put in the right files. It's probably best to make a coffee or set things up to download while you're in bed, instead of constantly checking up on an incorrect progress bar. Elsewhere, stopping at a crosswalk and pressing the button hoping the walk signal will come up might just be a waste of your time. It turns out that all that button pushing could be for nothing. Some crosswalk buttons need to be pressed, but others don't do anything at all. The crossing symbol will just light up whenever it wants to. Some crosswalks even switch between needing and not needing a button press, depending on the time of day. That said, it can be difficult for all of us pedestrians to determine whether a crosswalk button works or not. When in doubt, just push the button anyway. You don't want to stand around waiting for no reason. With more people going into the water and sharks, well, living in the water, the fear of bumping into a not-so-friendly shark is ever-increasing. This shared water space has pushed many companies to try to create shark repellents. This sounds like a good idea that should help keep both people and sharks more safe. Companies have tried everything – sprays, wetsuits, magnets, wax, and even electronic devices to repel the scary fish. The bad news is none of these products are confirmed to actually work. One in particular makes the sound of an orca. Sharks aren't too fond of being in the same area as them, but does pretending you're an orca stop a shark from biting you? If you feel safer using them, then go right ahead. But if you're looking for a shark deterrent that's 100% effective, it's just not available. Psst, here's what actually works. Stay out of the water! Rushing into an elevator and repeatedly pushing the closed door button in the US is basically a huge waste of time, unless you've got the special trick. In 1990, the US passed a Disabilities Act for elevators, which meant that elevators had to ensure that someone with a disability had time to get inside one. 
If you're on crutches, use a cane, or travel in a wheelchair, you don't have to worry about someone accidentally closing the elevator doors before you've had a chance to pass through them. There's one important loophole to this. If you're an emergency or maintenance worker, you'll have access to keys and codes that make that button operational. This is just another example of a placebo button you're invited to push, just to make you feel like you've done something. That impatient finger-poking isn't doing anything. Getting a bit warm or cold in the office? Better adjust that thermostat. Unfortunately, in the vast majority of office buildings, the system controls are kept inside air ducts, not on the wall. Technicians install dummy thermostats to give workers the illusion that they're dramatically changing the air conditioning or heat. Some are set to change 1 or 2 degrees, but they're often not connected to anything at all. Dummy thermostats came about around the 1960s. As heating prices rose, building leases often required employers to stay within specific temperatures. Faced with this problem, fake thermostats became the new rage for businesses. They offer people some feeling of control while keeping the temperature in the right range. Now, ever come across some premium PC cleaning software that promises to clean your PC and make it go as fast as when you purchased it? Yeah! These third-party PC cleaners are often made to seem like they really work, but they usually don't do much of anything at all. They'll detect non-problems and list them as problems. The worst example of this is when they list browser cookies and temporary files as having an effect on the computer's speed when they don't. It's better to stick to the operating system's built-in cleaner. It'll work fine if you ever need to clean your computer and save you having to splash out on one that does pretty much the same thing. Well, that's all I got. Time to burn some toast. After a bad day at work, you decide to hide yourself from the rest of the world. You turn off your phone and your laptop and lock yourself inside the bathroom. You jump out of your meditation when you hear a beeping sound. It's your toothbrush saying, data transfer completed. Your robot vacuum knocks at the door. Looks like it must be after you. Robot vacuums make a map of your home to get around and plan cleaning better. They can share this map with other gadgets via Wi-Fi and store them in the cloud. When advertisers get access to those maps, they can get an idea of your home size, your income level, and lifestyle to send the right ads your way. Hmm. Vacuums don't have microphones, but their navigation systems can be repurposed to listen to your conversations. They map the room with a laser beam directed at objects. Sound waves affect that light. If you collect that data, you can convert it back into sound waves and identify what someone said. Headphones and microphones are based on the same idea. Headphones turn electrical signals into sound, and microphones turn sound into electrical signals. If you plug your headphones into the microphone jack, they'll work as a microphone. Bad guys learn to do it remotely without your consent. There's malware that retasks your computer output channel into input channel. It can record sounds from across the room even when the headphones are in their jack and the microphone is turned off and disconnected from the computer. Then it compresses the audio and sends it over the internet. There are computer mice that look like regular ones but have microphones and a built-in SIM card in them. The mics are so powerful, they can even record whisper and broadcast that audio in real time. To activate it, you have to call the SIM card number and it goes on silently. To deactivate it, you can send an SMS to the same number. Some employers confirmed eavesdropping on their staff using that technology. A smart toothbrush remembers every move you made with it and shares it with you when you're done brushing. It also connects to your iPhone or Android using an app and sends data on your brushing habits to your dentist. They can watch over your brushing process and give you tips on how to take better care of your teeth. Smartwatches, fitness trackers, and other smart wearables monitor your health and can determine if you're walking, running, or driving with their built-in sensors. If third parties get control over that data, they can also monitor your hand movements as you unlock your phone, enter your PIN code at the ATM, or your password at the computer. The gadgets are smart enough to accurately guess all that secret data most of the time. They can also find out the email address you used when you registered with the app to identify who you are. Pacemakers and other health devices send patient data over the internet. In theory, criminals could obtain it during transfer and change it to look like the patient needs hospital treatment. That would make them leave their home and bad guys could take advantage of the situation. 
Smart toys that have cameras and microphones in them can record videos and sounds and send them to the toy maker. To keep prices on smart toys lower, they don't add expensive security mechanisms to protect that data. If cyber criminals get a hold of it, they can steal pictures, videos, or audio, and even identify GPS coordinates of the house. LED lights equipped with sensors and connected to video cameras can watch over and listen to conversations over a large distance. This technology was used at one large airport for security and comfort reasons. Cyber criminals went further and learned to use ordinary light bulbs for eavesdropping on conversations. To do it, they need a clean line of sight between a powerful telescope and the bulb of the right thickness. It won't work if you have drapes on your window. When you're talking or listening to music, there are changes in air pressure on the surface of the bulb and it's shaking a bit. A special converter can turn data on the sounds from electrical to digital. Internet-connected thermostats can be operated remotely, and that made them desirable for cyber criminals. They once got access to millions of debit and credit cards data through a large retailer's heating and cooling system. Other bad guys found a way to remotely lock smart thermostats' controls and demanded ransom to unlock them. Smart fridges can tell you when it's time to buy milk as they track your food preferences and have great connectivity. Smart dishwashers, coffee machines, washers and dryers are also collecting and transmitting your data, even at moments you don't think they're doing it. Criminals can make use of that data to find out a lot about your schedule and guess when you aren't at home. Your voice assistant makes your life easier, but it must listen to you 24-7 to make that possible. They never record anything you say before you activate them with your voice. Everything that follows is stored in the cloud and can be of use for different companies. They can learn what music you like to listen to, what news stories interest you the most, and where you make your reservations. Some companies hire human reviewers to listen to commands to see if voice recognition works well and improve its accuracy. Xbox admitted they also hired people to listen to users' audio to improve voice command features. The problem is that it made some recordings by mistake and strangers were listening to personal chats. Home security cameras can take videos, pictures, and audio recording and upload them to the cloud without you even knowing. Manufacturers say it's done to improve object recognition. You can get access to that camera footage remotely using an app. There are programs that can guess a CCTV password and forward the video stream to a third-party computer. They can also get control over the camera and disable any signs of monitoring, like red light, so it seems inactive. Almost every car has an event data recorder that tracks information on its location, average speed, road condition, and even your preferred route. Your computer on wheels constantly streams that data to its manufacturer. They use it to try to prevent accidents and make other improvements. It's not clear who owns all that car-related information, so in theory, it could end up at a third party. Smart TVs run an operating system just like computers and also have a file system, cameras for video face recognition, and a microphone. They are always connected to the internet, and if cyber criminals get access to a TV, that can change certain settings and record audio even when the TV is off. They could also watch you through the camera and use the smart gadget to move to other devices on the same network, like your laptop. Well, I'm totally creeped out, so what can we do about it? You can disable automatic content recognition to stop your TV from giving you viewing recommendations and limit voice activation function for a safer experience. You'll find that option in General or Advanced Settings under Viewing Information or Viewing Data. You can also disconnect it from the cloud altogether. Always change default passwords and usernames on new devices to secure your network. Make up a new password for every gadget every now and then. You can also split your modem and use one Wi-Fi signal for laptops, iPads, and the like, and the other for security cameras. Don't forget to turn off the Wi-Fi router when you leave the house to minimize the risk of a digital intrusion. Whenever possible, enable two-step authentication that demands physical access to the device to log in. Always install software updates as soon as the gadget manufacturer offers you to do it. Updates have patches for detected vulnerability issues. 
Cover your laptop camera with a dark-colored tape when you aren't using it. Delete your conversations with a voice assistant. You can do it at the manufacturer's website or app. Another option is to activate the delete by voice function in settings. Then you'll be able to tell the assistant to delete what you just said or your last conversations. You can also mute the device when you aren't using it and choose not to send data to manufacturer to help them improve services. If you have a thermostat that connects to your voice assistant, tap the microphone icon on its screen and set voice control to off. You won't be able to activate it remotely, and it won't be able to listen to wake words and send your audio anywhere. Okay, have a nice day! Okay, so right after being processed, plastic water bottles aren't the size you buy at the store. Even a gallon water bottle starts its life as a small tube. Later, it gets heated, inflated, and shaped into the bottle you know. Boy, I can relate to the heated and inflated part. Now, not all potato chips are actually fried potato slices. Some companies use a mix of potato flakes, cornstarch, and water to produce chips. This mix is then pressed into a dough, and chips are cut out from it with the help of shape molds. Then the chips are fried, which takes about 11 seconds. After that, all excess oil gets drained, and the chips are seasoned and packed. There's a legend that only two people in the world know the original recipe that gives Coca-Cola its signature taste. These people aren't allowed to travel together so that the recipe never gets lost. Even though it's just a popular legend, not many people are aware of all the ingredients of the world-famous drink. One of them used to be the cola nut. Hey, I used to be a cola nut. You can find these nuts inside the fruit of the cola tree. Each fruit is about the size of a chestnut and has between 2 and 5 cola nuts inside. The cola fruit and nuts are packed with caffeine. Nowadays, Coca-Cola is said to no longer contain the cola nut extract. It's rumored to have been replaced with artificial flavoring. But since the drink's recipe is such a closely guarded secret, no one knows for sure. Hey, maybe we can ask Pepsi! These days, it's quite simple to make a mirror. Producers take a regular sheet of glass as a base, then they apply a reflective coating. This usually means spraying a thin layer of either silver or aluminum onto the back of the sheet of glass. This process is called silvering. Some kinds of car wax contain carnauba wax, also called Brazil wax. That's a vegetable wax people get from the fronds of the carnauba tree growing in Brazil. To get the wax, the leaves of this tree first get dried and then beaten. Ooh, ooh, ow, ow! This is how you can remove the powdery wax. Now, pencils. First, their leads are made by mixing clay and graphite powder. This mixture is then baked. After that, pencil bodies are made. If they're wooden, the material should be chosen carefully. It should be soft enough to sharpen, but tough enough not to break. When the pre-cut sections are delivered to the factory, they have grooves cut in them. These grooves will later accommodate the leads. Then special glue is added. This way, the leads will stay in place. Next, every second section is sent to a special conveyor, and the leads are placed in the grooves. Then another section is glued to the one filled with leads. We get a large multi-pencil sandwich. Mmm, sandwich, I'm getting hungry. The two parts of this sandwich get compressed and cut lengthwise. Then they're shaped and form separate pencils. Lava lamps were invented in the middle of the 20th century. The magic happening inside is due to the right amount and type of ingredients. Two of them are oil and paraffin wax. The oil helps the wax heat up, and once it's heated, it starts rising up slowly. Once the blob reaches the surface, it cools down and sinks back to the bottom. Now, nutmeg is a strongly flavored spice used in many cuisines all over the globe. Despite its name, nutmeg isn't a nut. It's technically a seed native to the Spice Islands and East Indies tropical islands. Nutmeg grows on trees, and the seed itself is sealed in a shell. Once it's ripe, the outer shell cracks open. Chocolate comes from the cacao tree, which is native to the Amazon. These trees also grow in Central and South America and some other tropical climates in Africa and Asia. The seeds of the cacao tree are very bitter. They have to be fermented to develop the flavor you're used to. After this process, the beans get dried, cleaned, and roasted. 
the shell is removed, and crumbled bits of dried cocoa beans are ground to cocoa mass. This mass is then used in the production of all kinds of chocolatey things. <laughs> in the past, people used to chew different types of aromatic substances, including beeswax, tree resin, or even aromatic twigs. But modern-day chewing gum is made of a natural latex-like ingredient called chicle. It gets extracted from trees. Modern marbles are made from glass. The first step is to melt recycled glass and previously rejected marbles that turned out to be too small or too big. About 15 hours later, the molten glass is ready for processing. A special cutter bar moves through the stream of liquid glass every half a second. It separates small pieces of glass. There are future marbles called slugs. The faster the cutter bar moves, the smaller the marbles are. After that, the still-hot slugs are sent through several constantly rotating metal rollers. They keep the slugs apart and also cool them. These ridged rollers also give the marbles their spherical shape. As for the marble's final coloring, it's determined already at the melting stage. That's when the air passes the coloring through the glass. You can find springs everywhere, from tools, electronics, and toys to pens and mattresses. They come in different forms, for example, torsion, wire, extension, or compression springs. When a spring is made, a steel cord is passed to a derailleur. How thick this cord is depends on what kind of spring we need. The derailleur unwinds the roll and sends the cord to a computer-controlled forming machine. That's where the cord gets coiled to the needed length and cut into pieces. Now, to produce tomato ketchup, one of my favorites, you need tomato paste or puree, sugar, or some other natural sweetener, salt, spices, vinegar, and onion powder. First, the kneaded volume of the tomato paste is heated while being constantly stirred. Then other ingredients are added as well. Before the ketchup is bottled, it has to go through several cooling stages. Meanwhile, bottles are already aligned and waiting to be filled with the ketchup. This usually happens automatically. At the end of this process, caps and labels are added to the bottles. Cashew nuts are rich in plant protein, healthy fats and fiber, and low in sugar. But they're some of the most expensive nuts out there, and no wonder. The cashew tree, native to tropical regions of Brazil, produces a long stalk called a cashew apple. It resembles a small pear. Well then, why don't they just call it a cashew pear? Anyway, at the end of this stalk, there's a kidney-shaped nut. It's protected by a double shell that contains a poisonous, oily substance. It's the main reason cashews aren't sold in their shells like peanuts or pistachios. Cashews need to be dried and roasted first. This removes the toxins and makes the shell brittle and much easier to remove. Nail polish, as we know it today, is a rather modern invention. It became popular at the beginning of the 20th century. Different companies use different kinds of chemicals and ingredients to produce nail polish. But one of these ingredients is always the same – nitrocellulose. This substance is actually liquid, but it gets mixed with plasticizers. They make nail polish more flexible and allow you to wear it longer. The process of creating ice cream sandwiches is pretty simple. First, ice cream gets whipped. It's done to add some air. The resulting substance is then sent to the next part of the assembly. There, two lines of wafers are already sandwiched together, and ice cream is simultaneously injected between them. It happens so quickly that more than 100 ice cream sandwiches can be made in a minute. Mmm, how many can I eat in a minute? There are all kinds of plastic brooms out there, but there's one type that's made from recycled plastic bottles. With people buying 1 million plastic bottles all over the world, it's a cool way to reuse plastic. Tires production is a multi-step process. Tires are made from more than 15 main ingredients. Among them, there's synthetic and natural rubber, carbon black pigment, and chemical additives. Giant mixers stir these ingredients under high pressure and temperature. The final result is almost always thin rubber gum. It gets rolled into sheets. After that, tires get assembled on a special machine. Different kinds of cloth, rubber, and metal are used for the production of a tire. Finally, the tire gets cured in a special press under more than 300 degrees of heat and high pressure. 
This process lasts for 12 to 15 minutes. When they make darts, the flight shafts are produced first. 10-foot-long aluminum rods are put into a special machine. It has a few cutting tools that work from several angles at the same time. The rod turns into shafts. There are threads cut into each flight shaft so that it can be later attached to the dart barrel. That's the part you hold and fling. On the other end, a cross saw makes slots for the arrow flights. At the same time, brass rods turn into the barrels on another machine. Grooves are cut into the barrel surface. This makes them easier to hold. And finally, they produce a dart point. It's done with the help of a hydraulic press. It forces pointed steel into the hollow part of the barrel. And darts all there is about how they make darts. Well, it's a nice Sunday afternoon and you're shopping at your regular grocery store when you stumble upon a bloated package in the fresh produce aisle. You check the product information. It seems well within its expiration date. Then why the unusual shape, you may wonder? The answer is not always straightforward. For some types of fresh products, such as meat, fish, or seafood, sometimes even salads and cheese, scientists came up with something called MAP, or Modified Atmosphere Packaging, to ensure that these types of products with a relatively short shelf life stay fresh for as long as possible. A combination of gases is introduced in the packaging. It happens even before the product reaches your local grocery store. A French professor at the Montpelier School of Pharmacy stumbled upon this method after he noticed that fruits tend to stay fresh for longer periods of time in low oxygen storage conditions. The types of gases in mapped packaging can vary from product to product, but the main idea is to replace or reduce the content of oxygen. It's generally replaced with either nitrogen or carbon dioxide. Keep in mind that just because a bloated bag of salad is within its expiration date, it doesn't mean it's always safe to eat. The gases inside the bag may very well be there for their own purpose. But they can also be a sign that the product is spoiled. That's why the best course of action when shopping would be to check if the product is not expired. If it's still within the day, mm-hmm. check for any unusual odors or damage to mm-hmm. the packaging. If something seems off, it's best not to risk it. You can reach out to hey. any of the store staff if you have any questions or concerns. Most supermarkets these days have a layout which allows for a logical shopping order, like buying non-perishable items first, then adding refrigerated or frozen products. Fruits and vegetables should come last since you won't want them at the bottom of your shopping cart. Nobody likes a squished tomato. While I'm on the subject of fruits and veggies, try to get them earlier in the morning if possible. Veggies that have been sitting out all day may lose some of their shape and texture, while others may be a bit wilted away. Quick tip on waste management, never buy more produce than you intend to use in a week. Most fruits and vegetables don't even last that long, so it's best not to give in to cravings. Shopping on a full stomach might help with that as well, just as much as going shopping with a pre-made list of things you need to buy. Thoroughly inspecting the package of every product might save you some hustle later as well. Refrigerated products need to feel cold to the touch, whilst frozen ones need to be solid and with no sign of leakage. When you get home, make sure you refrigerate all the necessary items as soon as possible. Generally, they shouldn't be out of the refrigerator for more than two hours. Otherwise, their quality won't stay the same. Buying potted herbs from the grocery store may not be the first thing on your list, but it's surely something to consider. Not only are they available for a fraction of the cost, but they're also easy to grow and take care of. Just picture a nice herb garden right there on your balcony or even in the kitchen. Wouldn't that be nice? You'll always have fresh basil to top a mouth-watering pasta dish. Since you're still at the grocery store, pick up some coffee filters while you're at it. You may not have a machine at home that actually uses filters, but there are a lot more things you can use them for around the house. They can be used for straining liquids, safely stacking delicate china in your cupboards, or even polishing windows, or shoes for that matter. If your favorite fruits and vegetables are on sale, but buying large quantities would mean they go to waste, consider freezing them. You can stock up on items for smoothies, especially for the colder season when there are limited options for fresh fruits. And don't just grab the first thing on the shelf, especially if it's likely to go bad quickly. 
Stores restock their produce following a first-in, first-out layout. So the items at the back of the shelf will always be a tad bit fresher. The same goes for tea if you prefer it to coffee. Switch to buying loose-leaf tea, and you'll not only reduce the cost, you'll also be able to make your own homemade tea blends. Loose-leaf tea also has a stronger flavor than tea sold in tea bags. As for the other household stuff, stock up on items such as light bulbs, paper towels, or batteries. Chances are you'll always be needing at least one of these items, so it's best to buy them in larger quantities when on sale. They never go to waste, and let's face it, it's always annoying when you run out of batteries at home and your TV remote stops working. Hey, tell me about it. Try to reduce the number of times you go to the grocery store to buy just one item. It's inefficient, and most likely, you'll end up buying things that you don't actually need. Uh, That shopping list starts to make a lot more sense now, doesn't it? Another list worth making, the one containing whatever you have in the fridge. Try to create such a list at least twice a week. Meal planning for at least a week in advance will also help you reduce impulse buying. If you already know what you'll want for dinner on Wednesday, why add anything else to the cart if it's unnecessary? At the same time, start getting creative with your leftovers. There's no need for them to go to waste when you can mix and match or add some additional herbs and flavors to spice them up. Store leftovers in transparent containers for added visibility. And don't be afraid to set out a leftover day during the week. It's also nice to look at them as ingredients rather than leftovers. Use extra leftover pasta or steamed vegetables for a frittata or an (laughs) omelette. Blend together cooked vegetables with some tomatoes to create a pasta sauce. Put together some wraps for the next day's lunch with anything from leftover cooked rice to meat and vegetables. Or, if you're really looking for the easiest method to save leftovers, you can always turn them into soup. Last night's vegetable side dish can turn into a wholesome lunch if you simply add a can of broth and blend it all together. Even a two-day-old loaf of bread can be salvaged if you cut it diagonally, sprinkle the slices with some herbs and olive oil, and pop them in the oven for a couple of minutes. You'll then have yourself some nice homemade croutons for that previously mentioned soup. A little label know-how never hurt anyone either. Be on the lookout for ingredients you've never heard of or those you can't pronounce. An item that usually has more than five ingredients listed on the packaging should be avoided. Even the way you carry your groceries in the supermarket can affect how and what you buy. If you prefer baskets to shopping carts, you're more prone to impulse searches. That's what a study published by the Journal of Marketing Research claims. It happens due to the effort you put in actually carrying the items around. Choosing a shopping cart will most likely make you comfortable enough to browse through enough products and read labels thoroughly. When your grocery list is not too big, go for the self-checkout aisle if available. Studies have shown that impulse purchases are lowered by up to 32% if you actually scan your own items on the way out. That's because the regular checkout line is specially designed to keep you from letting go of any items you might have reconsidered buying. There's literally nowhere you can put down your undesired products outside of your grocery cart, and if there's anyone else waiting in line behind you, good luck sliding out. The food arrangement on the shelves can also pose a threat to both your budget and your habits. Since people are more inclined to buy the items they see first, the most expensive products are placed at eye level, and the budget options are placed on the top and bottom shelves. Take your time and scan your aisles of interest. You'll be surprised to see that most items placed on higher or lower shelves are often not only more cost-effective, but also less packed with additives or artificial flavor. Hey, be careful. It's a jungle in there. Next time you follow a recipe where you need to separate egg yolks from whites, try this. Peel a clove of garlic and rub your fingers with it. Carefully break an egg into a bowl. With your garlicky fingers, pick up the yolk. And voila, you can now marvel at how perfectly it separates from the egg white. If it's egg peeling time, there are two easy ways to do it. When cooking eggs, add a teaspoon of baking soda to the boiling water. This will make peeling eggs much easier. You can also place them under cold running water as soon as they're ready. The eggshells will come off much easier, and you won't burn your hands while peeling the eggs. 
The sides of roads have sleeper lines for a very important reason. Their main function is to alert those drivers who doze off behind the wheel. When a car starts steering off the road, the tires go over the lines and the sound wakes the driver up. Those price tags and labels that come glued to your Tupperware are easier to remove than you might think. No need to waste hot water and soap trying to remove them. Take a hair dryer instead. Blow some hot air directly onto the tag for a minute or so. There you go, the label comes off at once. White household appliances might get yellow with time. To make them white again, use this simple trick. Apply bleaching cream to the surface of an item. Wrap it in plastic and let it stay this way overnight. The next morning, check it out. It'll be as white as when you first bought it. When you buy a pack of cans, opening it might turn into a problem. You probably tear a hole in the plastic and try to squeeze a can out of there. But the bottom of cans was actually designed to make this part much easier. Grab a can and rub it over the top of another can from the pack. A circle the exact same size of the can will be cut out. This way, you can easily remove the new can from the pack without destroying the entire thing. Now to the art of lime squeezing. When you pick limes at the grocery store, you never know how juicy they are. And often, when you bring them home and squeeze them, almost no juice comes out. Try heating these citruses in a microwave for 30 seconds before cutting them open. You'll see that the juice will come out much easier. But be careful, they're going to be hot and you don't want to burn your hands. If you're hanging out with your friends and feel like listening to some music but don't have a loudspeaker, there's no need to worry. Place your phone in a cup or bowl. The sound will get louder instantly. If you don't have a hanger at hand but still need to hang your shirt, this trick is for you. Most dress shirts have a tiny loop on the back between the shoulders and you can use it to hang your shirt. How about the worst case scenario? Your phone is running out of battery and you're running late. Try this simple trick. Switch on airplane mode. Your phone will charge to 100% in no time. You can run the sticky part of a post-it note along your laptop's keyboard. This will help remove tiny bits of food and dust that get stuck in between the keys. Avoid putting really hot food into plastic containers. Hot plastic releases all kinds of toxic chemicals, and we don't want our food to absorb that nasty stuff, right? What can be better than a bubble bath in the evening? But the bubbles are not only pretty and smell nice, they also keep the water temperature hot for longer. This way, you can enjoy a long, hot bath without getting cold too quickly. You got home craving a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but your peanut butter now has two layers, and the oil is at the top. To avoid getting disappointed, next time, store a peanut butter jar turned upside down. Your screwdriver and wrench can work together to remove that stubborn screw. Grab your screwdriver's handle with the wrench and use it to apply more force. This method will also help you reach more difficult areas. There is a reason why your coffee stirrer looks like a straw. It has holes in it because it reduces the amount of plastic manufacturers have to use. Plus, they prevent the stirrer from floating. The holes in the stirrer get filled with coffee, which in turn makes it heavier. And speaking of coffee, you should never buy the product that is more than 18 months old. Make sure to look at the best before date when buying it. If you've ever had trouble with those classic salt and pepper shakers, the ones you may see in diners, I've got a trick for you. Instead of shaking your entire arm to try and get some salt out of the container, try rubbing the bottom of one container with the bottom of the other. Grab the salt and hold it so that the bottom of the container faces downward. Now, while holding the pepper shaker upright, rub the two bottom parts together, creating circular friction between them. After this, the salt will spill effortlessly. After a long day of hiking, your shoes might smell funny. Well, I've got good news for you. Put dry tea bags inside your shoes and keep them in a dry place for a while. The tea bags will absorb bad smells and make your shoes dry. If you've torn your flip-flop while taking a walk, there's a way to save the day, but only if you have a bread clip with you. First, push the strap back into its hole. Then attach the bread clip to the bottom of the flip-flop strap. Here you go!
Your body needs a daily amount of vitamin C to boost your immune system, but oranges are a tricky fruit to peel. To avoid getting sprayed all over your face, start by cutting off both the top and the bottom parts of the orange. Then, cut the peel vertically. Hook your fingers under the opposite sides of the cut and open your orange. If it's difficult for you to figure out how much detergent you need to wash your clothes, here's a tip for you. Usually, detergent caps have markings that indicate the exact amount of liquid you should use per wash. It helps your detergent last longer. Permanent markers are not as permanent as you might believe they are. I can prove it. Let's say you used a permanent marker, thinking it was a regular one, to draw something on a whiteboard. Good news for you, you don't need to throw the board away yet. There's a way to save it. Get a regular marker and use it to draw over the lines left by the permanent one. Let it sit for a while so that both markers blend in together. The thing is, the ink of the regular marker contains a solvent that dissolves the pigment the permanent marker contains. Now take a paper towel and rub the whiteboard clean. The marker will come off easily. If you need to peel peaches, use the technique called blanching. First, heat up some water. Wait until it starts boiling. Soak the peaches in the water for about 20 seconds. Then put the fruit into a bowl with cold water and leave them for about five minutes. There you have it. The peel will come off nicely and easily. That plastic lid covering your drink can be used as a coaster. Take the lid off and put it on the table. The bottom of your cup will fit perfectly into the lid's inner ring. No more stained tables from now on. Bristles on escalators are there for safety reasons. They remain stationary while the escalator is moving, preventing people from standing too close to the sides. This helps to avoid accidents like getting your shoelaces stuck. If you pay close attention to elevator doors, you'll notice they have a small hole in them. This is a keyhole, and only authorized personnel have the key to it. They use it in emergency situations or during a regular maintenance routine. Have you ever wondered what these extra holes at the top of your running shoes are for? They're designed so that you can tie the shoes in multiple different ways. That's useful when you want to compensate for things such as a bad stride or even a damaged toe. Plus, you can change the look of your shoes the way you prefer. Many people use a dust jacket of their book as a bookmarker. No problem with that, it will save your book from bent page corners. But the primary purpose of a dust cover is to keep the book safe from distortions. For instance, if you spill juice or drop some of the food on your book while reading it. The Tic Tac dispenser has this little groove on its top, so you can dispense only one Tic Tac at a time. Even though, let's be honest here, nobody does that. Most of us just spill a whole bunch at once and then we wiggle all those extra Tic Tacs back in. Those rubber bumps you see between the tire treads are there for your safety. The raised edges tell you what the minimum height of your tread is. If the bump and the edges are even, it's time for you to visit the tire shop as soon as possible. But if the bumps are well beneath the level of the edges, you're good to go. What about that black grating on the microwave window? It's something called a Faraday shield. And it's there to prevent microwaves from getting away and turning the entire room into a Faraday cage. If the microwaves escape, your meal won't cook properly either. So yep, the cage is not there to make it difficult for you to see your meal while it's cooking. It's keeping the electromagnetic energy inside. How about a wrench compatible screwdriver? Cover your screwdriver with the end of your wrench and you can increase its torque. That's why the head of your screwdriver is designed the way it is. When you have odd angles, you can use this strategy. You've probably heard those myths, the blue side of the eraser can erase the pen. False. Its purpose is to erase a pencil but in case you're writing something on heavier paper. The blue side can remove smudges you see after using the pink eraser too. Have you ever wondered why oranges in supermarkets mostly come in the red mesh bag? It's a trick to make this food look more orange and encourage you to make a purchase. An extra tip, don't throw away the mesh bag. Tie it up so you can have a small pot scrubber to clean your sink, kitchen, appliances, and dishes. 
you can see golf balls don't have a perfectly round shape. Their surface is covered with many little dimples, something golf balls didn't always have. At one point, experienced golfers started noticing how through time, older balls with imperfections, such as nicks and bumps, could travel further. Such things create turbulence in the air around the golf ball, which eventually reduces drag. So, manufacturers started producing balls with dimples so they could go farther and faster. You might have noticed that sometimes there are ridges in toothpick tops. It's more hygienic because when you break that off, you can prop the toothpick up on it and it won't touch anything. Another safety feature you'll find, this time in your car, is a tab on your rear view mirror. With it, you can change the position of the mirror so you don't get blinded if there's a car behind you with its high beams on. So this little tab helps you control the glare of lights coming from behind. This feature showed up in the 1930s, but in the early 1970s, it became a part of standard equipment in most trucks and cars. Do you see that tiny hole on your iPhone right next to the rear-facing camera? It's a microphone, and it's there so your phone can record sound as you turn your camera around. Some cables have a thick cylinder towards the end of the cord. It's called a ferrite core or a choke. It's a magnetic iron oxide that stops high-frequency electromagnetic interference. For example, you know that annoying static noise you get if you bring your phone too close to a speaker? This interrupts your call, which is why cable cords with big cylinders are pretty useful because they prevent these things. Do you know why nearly all luggage bags and backpacks have two zippers? It's way more convenient and easier to open in that way. But not just that, you can also lock these two zippers together to keep the stuff inside your bags safer. You know how toilets at public spots like malls have those big gaps at the bottom? It's primarily for better circulation of air. This type of door also makes it easier to clean the toilet or check if it's occupied if you're standing in line. Other than that, if you get stuck there and the lock gets broken, you still have a way to escape. You can just crawl out. Ever notice those plastic end caps on utility knives? And they also have scales on them, which indicates you may use them multiple times, but with sharp edges. You can separate the blades through these plastic end caps. Then, you can move the slider and bring the sharp blade to the front. If you've ever taken a moment to examine a regular grocery cart, especially their fold-out section, you probably notice those metal loops jutting out. They're designed to protect the items you carry in your cart. You can use them to hang bags with soft items. You don't want to accidentally squish with heavier products, like bread, or easily breakable things like eggs. Many coffee mugs come with curved notches on their bottom. When you're washing your mugs, put them against the rack at an angle in your dishwasher. This way, the water won't pool in there, so your favorite cup will be completely dry by the time you take it out of the dishwasher. If you're a McFlurry fan, you've probably noticed there's a square hole in the handle of the spoon. It's there so you can attach it to the special machine that mixes the ice cream and your favorite toppings together. The machine has a bar that slips into this square-shaped spoon and then thoroughly stirs it. And you get the spoon so they can minimize the mess during the process. Quite neat, wouldn't you say? A regular milk jug has a dent on one side. Some might see it as a random design decision, but a dent has several purposes. One of them is to get bigger if there's a gas buildup. This happens when your milk is spoiled so you don't even have to try to check this out. Also, the dent is there so the jug doesn't burst if you accidentally drop it. The dent allows the expansion space that deals with the sudden pressure that happens when you drop the jug. Dental floss. Sure, it's important for your dental health, and it's easy to assume what you do with it. But dental floss is great in the kitchen as well because it's a very precise cake slicer, way better than a regular knife. Most kitchen shears have a serrated opening right there at the center where the blades and handles meet. It's something you can use to trim difficult herbs such as rosemary, thyme, or chives. 
Because of this opening, you don't need to pick the leaves off by hand, but de-stem them in one motion. The majority of gelatin containers or single-serving yogurts come with a tinfoil lid, and in most cases, you can use this covering as a disposable spoon. Just peel away the covering and after a couple of simple folds, you'll have a perfect little spoon for your midday snack. Hey, hey, summer's coming! Here's our Brightside approved checklist of stuff you gotta take with you, plus some tips for you to be fully prepared for your vacation. No matter how hard we try, we sometimes tend to overpack. Who, me? Now, remember one thing, the bigger your suitcase is, the more you will try to cram into it. Next time you pack your stuff, try to stick to a 54321 rule. This rule says that for a one-week vacation, we can easily limit to five pairs of socks and underwear, four tops, three bottoms, two pairs of shoes, selected by how active you're planning to be on your vacation, and one hat. But I suggest we add one more item to this rule a lightwear rain jacket like this one. It takes no more space than two pairs of socks, but it can be a lifesaver for unpredictable weather conditions. If you're afraid your clothes will get dirty fast and you'll have to hide those ketchup stains on your vacay photos, there's a solution on how not to do it. Have you heard of on-the-go detergent? These are small packets you can throw in your suitcase and hand wash your clothes in the sink. Binder clips may seem to have nothing to do with vacations. After all, these are office essentials. But let me try to bring you over. They have a ton of applications. Use them to hang up wet clothes, hold broken luggage straps together, you name it. If you still prefer to ignore the 54321 rule and you're struggling to cram a couple more sweatshirts into your suitcase or backpack, plastic bottles are going to help you out. Grab one and cut it in two halves. Next, you're going to need an elastic band. Then roll the sweatshirt you need in a very tight roll and put it in between the two bottle halves. Secure this weird construction with an elastic band and voila! It now takes up way less space in your luggage. But if you're not into DIY solutions, here's another option. Packing cubes to organize clothes. They'll keep all your stuff well organized and you'll easily find what you need without digging through your entire suitcase. Plus, they come in a variety of colors and sizes, so you can separate your clothing by type or color. Well, isn't that neat? Staying connected is essential when traveling, and a portable phone charger can help ensure that your phone stays charged even when you're on the go. Look for a charger with multiple ports so that you can charge your phone and other devices at the same time. Just a quick tip here. Many devices are now switching to Type-C cables, so make sure all your devices are compatible with your portable charger. If you're a frequent traveler, here's a piece of advice for you. Never, ever unpack your toiletries. This way you won't forget anything next time you fly. The best solution is to keep a separate kit with all the products you need, like a contact lens case or a toothbrush. But if you still don't have one, it's high time you made up your goodie bag with your essentials. You probably already have small bottles at home. Make sure it has an inscription on them, claiming the bottles are not over 3.4 ounces if you plan to take them on board. However, if you have no bottles, there are plenty of them online, like this one. The kit you want to buy should have funnels to pour any shampoo or gel easily. Some of the kits even have scoops, which is great! You can do ice cream! No, sorry. They help portion out a small amount of moisturizer so you won't spoil the entire jar with your finger grease. However, there are a couple of things you better keep in your pockets and not in the toiletry kit, like hand sanitizer and lip balm. While everything's pretty clear with hand sanitizer, lip balm has way more uses than you can imagine. If you have dry cuticles, lip balm will make them soft and pliable again. If you want to clean up your makeup, lip balm and a Q-tip will work wonders, unless it's minty. You can even use it instead of eyebrow gel if you left yours at home, and it can also help tame flyaway hairs. Traveling can be uncomfortable, especially when trying to sleep on a plane or in a car. A compact travel pillow can make a big difference in your comfort level and help you arrive at your destination feeling refreshed. Keeping your belongings safe while traveling is essential. 
and TSA-approved travel locks can help. These locks can be opened by TSA agents without damaging your luggage, making them a great option for air travel. The world is very diverse, and so are plugs. If you're traveling to a new and faraway destination, don't forget to check what kind of plugs they have there. For example, if you're traveling to the UK, you can stick to this adapter. A small spray bottle can significantly upgrade your look. Yes, it can. For example, if your favorite t-shirt tends to wrinkle a lot, you can sort of iron it with a spray bottle. Hang it up and spray it with water. The wrinkles will disappear, and your t-shirt will look fresh and presentable, hopefully. Now let's talk duct tape. Duct tape in your luggage may be pretty stress-relieving. Now picture it. You're going back home with a whole bunch of gifts you bought for your family and friends. Whoops! The zipper on your suitcase just didn't resist the pressure, and it busted. Duct tape is coming to the rescue. Yeah, a suitcase wrapped in duct tape might look somewhat funny, but it's still better than shelling out a pretty penny on a brand new suitcase you weren't planning to buy. Yeah, that does make sense. Laundry bags may come in handy when you separate your dirty clothes from your clean ones. I know, you can do that with plastic bags, but laundry bags are sort of more eco-friendly. Plus, once you come home, they'll spare you some time. You won't need to dig through your suitcase trying to find all the clothes you want to wash. You'll just need to throw the laundry bag into the washing machine. If you're traveling to the seaside, you might want to consider grabbing a quick dry towel like this one. They're usually made of microfiber that dries much quicker than regular cotton. Plus, these guys are pretty low-maintenance, as they can be machine-washed at up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Next on, dryer sheets. You know, we all sweat, and our feet sweat too, especially if we walk miles and miles exploring a new location. So when you return to the hotel and take your sneakers off, woo! just put a dryer sheet in each sneaker. It'll absorb the odor, and your sneakers will be ready for more adventures. English is surely an international language, but you may still get into a situation where no one speaks English and you don't have an internet connection to Google Translate what you want to say. To play it safe, create a set of flashcards with essential vocabulary to help you out in basic situations. A favorite snack may be one of the most commonly forgotten by traveler's items. Yeah, they do give you food on the plane, but sometimes you may want to have an alternative. Plus, your snack can even save your budget in case you have a long connection. The prices in the airport lounge are crazy. Even if you travel in summer, it doesn't mean you don't need any warm clothes. Make sure you have a zip hoodie or something of that kind, especially on board. Thing is, you never know if it's going to be cold or hot on the plane. Sometimes it gets pretty stuffy in there, but it can also be freezing cold. Airplane blankets, as well as tray tables, are swarming with germs, so it's better to have your own clothes to keep warm. As for tray tables, I doubt you can bring your own on board, so just don't forget to clean them with an antibacterial wet wipe. And have a safe fly! You're trying on a pair of jeans, a dress, or a jacket, and are about to dig your hand into the pocket when you realize there's no depth to it. The pocket is simply not there. But why would anyone create pockets you can't put anything in? And uh, (coughs) now would be a good time to pick your iPhone up from off the floor. Well, the reason for fake pockets is simple. If a clothing item has a specific cut or shape, pockets may spoil it. They can alter the item's shape either in the warehouse or already on the retail rack. The solution? Getting rid of pockets in key areas. Plus, fake pockets are obviously cheaper, and they don't get stretched out. Interestingly, this practice goes back to the 17th century. That's when pockets were actually removable. They resembled small bags, and women, for example, could move them from one outfit to another. Unfortunately, it was also very convenient for pickpockets. They could grab such a pocket and run off with it. Then, clothes became more streamlined, and slim pockets started to be sewn right into them instead of attachable bags. This was believed to make the shape of a person's silhouette more alluring. But soon, slimmer skirts came into fashion and pockets went out of it, and people started using handbags instead.
These days, most pockets are real, but some of them are still fake. So how can we make sure that we don't actually turn a fake pocket into a hole thinking it's a real one? Well, first of all, take a look at the stitching along the edge of the pocket, where it's supposed to open up. If you see a single loose thread, just snip a piece of it and start pulling gently. If the pocket is real, the thread will easily come out. But if you feel that the stitching won't budge, most likely you have a faux pocket on your hands. If this is the case, just leave it be. Now let's move on to some other everyday objects that may be hiding some secrets. For example, those lines on some kinds of chips. For one thing, they help with the distribution of spices and seasonings. In other words, all those substances that make your chips taste like cheese are mostly stored inside the lines. Plus, the lines make chips crunchier. Highlighters are filled with a special semi-transparent fluorescent ink that can glow in dim light. Yellow and light green hues are the most popular because they don't prevent you from seeing the text after black and white photocopying. Photocopiers perceive yellow and light green marks as almost non-existent and don't print them. Now, back in the day, the first jeans had one problem. Workers and miners, who were the original jeans wearers, put too much pressure on the poor piece of clothing. As a result, the seams couldn't withstand the stress and tore. So, tiny metal studs were invented to prevent this from happening. Most metallic zippers have a hidden lock inside them. That's why you shouldn't leave the zipper handle in an upward position. When you pull it downwards, it automatically locks. It's all thanks to several tiny grooves hidden underneath the handle. Now, about those horizontal lines on plastic bottles. They help hold bottles up. Some bottles are produced from soft plastic. Without the lines, they wouldn't keep their shape. Instead, they would twist easily or even break. Bath foam isn't only for fun or a nice smell. It helps regulate the temperature, too. The bubbles keep the water hot, and you can enjoy your bath a bit longer, with or without your rubber ducky. Ever notice that layer of clear liquid and gel pens? It's called the ink follower or stopper fluid. The gel in such pens contains pigment particles dissolved in a polymer solution. The gel should be thick enough to keep the pigment particles suspended, but also thin enough to flow first onto the ball and then the paper. The main task of the stopper fluid is to be a barrier to prevent the gel from evaporating or leaking out. Without this transparent fluid, your gel pen wouldn't function. The fluid always stays in one position and doesn't get dissolved with the gel. Neither does it move backward or flow out of the pen. The holes in the bottoms of your earphones allow air to circulate up and through the speakers. It allows to increase low frequencies, making the bass sound deeper. The quality of the sound also becomes much better. Some plastic milk containers have dents on their sides. Try as they might, they just cannot park without some damage. Nah, I made that up. These dents serve several purposes. For one thing, when milk spoils, this process usually causes swelling and high-pressure buildup inside the container. Oh boy! That's when the dent comes in handy. It pops out and doesn't let the jug blow up. Plus, if you ever decide to freeze the milk, it will expand like any other liquid. And then again, the indentation will pop out and prevent the container from breaking inside your freezer. That's a good thing. Airplane windows have rounded edges, and that's a crucial safety measure. It prevents aircraft accidents. Weak spots are usually situated in the corners. If airplane windows were square or rectangular, each of them would have four potential weak spots. Under pressure, they would collapse. If you look closely at a tram's overhead lines, you'll see that its contact wires zigzag back and forth instead of going in a straight line. The thing is that all trams have pantographs attached to their roofs. The upper part of the pantograph is gradually worn down by the overhead wire and eventually needs to be replaced. To wear it down evenly, the wire is not installed strictly along the tram's path, but in zigzag patterns. As the tram moves, the pantograph slides along the wire and it wears down evenly. You might have wondered why some gas cans have two holes with caps, one bigger and one smaller. Before, I thought that the little hole was used when you poured something into a smaller container. But mm. I was wrong. A very infrequent occasion. In reality, 
you're supposed to uncap it before you pour the gas inside the bigger hole to prevent it from glugging and spilling on your clothes and on the ground. Most of the buttonholes on a shirt are vertical, but the top, and sometimes bottom ones, are horizontal. The reason is simple. These two buttons slip out more often than others. Luckily, producers have found the solution that can prevent these buttons from slipping out. Horizontal buttonholes. What engineering? Buttons tend to slip out less from such buttonholes. Stick sachets of sugar or salt are easier to open than many people think. There's no need to tear off one of the ends. The right way is actually to tear them down the middle. Some boots have loops sticking out on the back. Their main purpose is to help you pull your shoes on easier. Just tug on the loop while you're pushing your heel into the boot. You can also use these loops to hang your boots on a hook when they're dirty or when you want to dry them after washing. Or you can run your laces through the loop if you want to tie them around your ankle. When you're on board the plane, you might spot a little triangle over your seat. Such triangles show the flight crew the best spots to check the plane's flaps through the window, just in case they're flapping. If your shoes are really slippery, just take a bit of sandpaper and rub it on the soles for better traction. They'll become more grippy, and you'll be able to wear them out in the rain. Now, if they get too wet, they might turn gripey, but that's only if you have talking shoes. If you drill several holes at the bottom of your garbage can, putting in and taking out trash bags will become much easier. You won't have any problems with suction. You can usually find some silica gel in bags, shoes, and many other things you buy. This shell absorbs excess moisture. Don't throw it away. Each time your shoes get wet, put a few packets of silica gel inside. The thermos wasn't actually invented to keep your coffee warm. It was made by a Scottish scientist who just wanted a safe place to put his chemicals at a stable temperature. So he took two bottles, put the smaller one inside the bigger one, and vacuumed out the air between them. Well, anyway, thanks for the hot coffee. Imagine you're an art detective, and your task is to explore the mysteries behind the world's most famous paintings. I'm talking about works from Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Picasso. So grab your magnifying glass as this journey is about to begin. First off on your list is Rome. After enjoying delicious pasta, you head to the Sistine Chapel, home to the world's most famous ceiling. Oh, and you know how they say Michelangelo painted the frescoes lying down? This is just a myth. Actually, the painter created a complex system of platforms that allowed him to paint standing. You're checking out the creation of Adam, that fresco in the middle. The Italian artist Michelangelo, the author of this masterpiece, was widely known for his study of human anatomy. Art experts argue that the right part of the painting is an anatomically correct depiction of an enlarged brain. To proof check this, you try overlapping a picture of the organ and the artwork. It seems to be a match. The cerebellum, the optic nerve, and the pituitary gland are all there. Even the floating green scarf thingy appears to match the vertebral artery. Some researchers think it was Michelangelo's way of depicting knowledge and wisdom. But you have to sleep on it to decide what you think. Moving on, you catch a train and arrive in Florence. Time for a quick gelato break, then straight to the Academia Gallery. One of art's most celebrated sculptures is waiting for you inside. Michelangelo's David. David is a 17-foot tall marble wonder. It was carved for about three years. The mystery surrounding it is to figure out the statue's true expression. Looking at him from below, you'll think his face is serene and peaceful. But art historians argue that this work was largely misunderstood. Apparently, his body hides a very different story. Take a closer look, and you'll notice his brows are frowning, and the veins in his arms are popping out. That doesn't look too relaxed, does it? Michelangelo's idea was to depict David right before an important confrontation. So maybe he wasn't all that serene after all. Italy is so rich in art, you can't leave just yet. You're still in Florence. You pay a visit to the famous Uffizi Gallery. Many famous paintings are hosted by this museum, but you're checking out Botticelli's Primavera, or Spring. This artwork is mysterious from the get-go. 
experts can't say the exact year it was commissioned. It remained untitled for years, until the painter Giorgio Vasari finally came up with a name for it. Usually, when critics and viewers admire this painting, they focus on the figures in the foreground. But in this case, the actual work lies in that Botticelli painted over 46 different plant species with almost identical precision. And, oh, in the painting overall, these plant figures are repeated over 200 times. Unbelievable! I'd say the last visits were full of impressions, weren't they? Ready to keep going? A plane ride later, you arrive in Paris. The City of Lights, Berets, and the famous Mona Lisa. You go through the Museum de Louvre and come to Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece, La Gioconda. There are many theories regarding this work of art, and you dive into some of them. A strong case has been made that the Mona Lisa could be a self-portrait of da Vinci himself. Historians have thoroughly compared da Vinci's face and that of the Mona Lisa. And guess what? They appear to be strikingly similar. Oh, and then there's the smirk theory. Dentist and art expert Joseph Bartowski claims to have discovered the secret behind Mona Lisa's smirk. He says her tight facial expression is a typical indication of someone who lost their front teeth. Could it be so? Also, in 2010, the Italian Committee for Cultural Heritage found a collection of symbols hidden in the painting. These are only visible through highly technological magnifying lenses, but they showed that Leonardo inscribed an LV inside Mona Lisa's right eye. Experts guess that this is da Vinci's signature, but the other symbols, a CE in the left eye and a 72 in the arch of the background bridge are still very mysterious. Phew, you covered a lot of ground on this one. Ah, of course, at the end of your visit, remember to test if her eyes really follow you around. Now you're headed to Amsterdam to check out the Rijksmuseum. You came to see a specific Rembrandt painting that hides a mysterious story. The Night Watch is one of Rembrandt's most famous paintings, but experts argue that the name of the painting and its content are mismatched. Let's take a closer look. The painting depicts a large group ready to embark on a mission. Rembrandt's technique is called chiaroscuro, highlighting the contrast between light and shade. Until 1947, art critics believed the painter was depicting a nighttime scene. But when the painting was cleared of a thick dust layer, it became clear that the scene was happening in broad daylight, with the sun streaming down from the top left. Now, it's too late to change its name to The Day Watch. While in Amsterdam, you find a museum dedicated to Van Gogh's art. Did you know that he painted over 900 paintings during an impressive period of only 10 years? Anyway, the Van Gogh Museum hosts the biggest collection of yellow sunflower paintings you'll probably see in your life. Actually, almost all of Van Gogh's paintings feature dominant yellow shades. This particularity of his art may be a result of how he saw the world. Some art experts have speculated that one of Van Gogh's remedies changed his color perception, making him see more yellow around him. Okay, so this trip just keeps getting better. The next stop on your list is the United Kingdom. Then, on to the National Gallery. You may spend hours looking at Jan van Eyck's painting Arnolfini Portrait, and not see anything out of the ordinary. In the foreground, a couple holds hands and stares at the viewer. But if you zoom in on the mirror on the wall, you'll see two more people in the room. Art experts say the male figure in the painting has his hands raised to greet these two people seen in the mirror, and that one of the figures is von Eyck himself. Oh, and that's not the only watermark the painter left. Above the mirror, you'll see his flamboyant signature. Jan von Eyck was here, 1434. And speaking of people trying to sneak into their art, Caravaggio, the renowned Italian Renaissance painter, left a little Easter egg in one of his famous paintings, Bacchus. This one is a bit difficult to spot. In the half-filled jar in the bottom left corner of the painting, there is a tiny self-portrait of the painter himself, hidden amongst the liquid. To see the image clearly, one needs the help of sophisticated technology or at least a very efficient magnifying lens. But it's there, a male figure, aka Caravaggio, with a brush in his hand. Fun fact, 
The tiny self-portrait was first noticed in 1922, over 300 years after the painting was completed. It was forgotten due to poor conservation. To finish the trip, you fly overseas across the Atlantic, all the way to Chicago. The enormous collection of the Art Institute hosts a well-known painting by Pablo Picasso, the old guitarist. This painting's secret is so well hidden that it also needs the help of X-ray machines and super fancy technology. But the results are worth it. The readings show that Picasso painted the old guitarist on top of another unfinished painting. We can clearly see the outlines and shapes of a half-drawn female figure that Picasso gave up on mid-work. The emerging artists of the time used that way of saving money quite often, as canvases were expensive. This was quite a tiring world trip, wasn't it? Get some rest, Sherlock of Art. If you look at it on the street, you'll think a fire hydrant is about three feet in height. But the actual size of the device used to provide water supply to firefighters all over the world is twice as large. That is, if you count the rest of the hydrant, which is hiding underground. They're mostly red, and it's not just a matter of urban design. First of all, they need to be of bright, easily noticeable colors, so firefighters can spot them fast when they need to. The choice of color depends on how much water the hydrant can hold. It can sometimes vary depending on the location, but here's the breakdown. A red fire hydrant can splash 500 gallons of water per minute, while an orange one at least 1,000 gallons. Green ones mostly process 1,500 gallons of water per minute, and the most plentiful ones colored blue can generally contain over 1,500 gallons. Hey bowling fans, isn't it super annoying when your bowling ball gets cracked? Turns out that most of them get damaged because of incorrect storage or spikes in temperature. Now come on and face it, since it's already cracked a bit, aren't you curious what's actually inside the bowling ball? Cause I sure am. Let's have a look. They mostly make the inner core of the ball of powdered metal oxides, like calcium or iron oxide. They mix them with some resin and catalyst to harden the whole mixture. So that light bulb shape you now see inside of the ball is actually its heaviest part. It also influences how your bowling ball rotates when going down the lane. The same goes with spray paint cans. When you shake it, it makes a weird noise. But what is that thing in there? It's called a pea, and it's meant to hold the paint mixture in place and maintain its shape. They generally make it out of plastic, metal, or ceramic. It basically acts as a whisk to make sure your paint is well mixed together before you apply it to your surface of choice. Ever wondered how soda bottles keep that refreshing fizz for that long? Well, they have a little plastic ring fastened to the lid. They place it there to keep the gas from escaping and making the soda go flat, even if you shake it around in your bag the whole day. Speaking of things we use on a hot summer's day, wait, wait, don't put your baseball cap on just yet. Take a look at it for a minute and you'll notice there's a small button on the very top. Is it functional or is it just there for the sake of design? Way back when people started using fabrics to cover their heads, some say the button was actually functional. Since it's on top of the cap where the fabric panels come together, the top button helps keep the cap crown in one single piece. Now with recent advances in fabric and pattern design, the button is more of an aesthetic feature. It's used to cover up the joint point of the fabric panels. Your cap might not have a button at all, but don't you think a cap actually looks better with one? Cotton pads have two sides, and if you take the time to look at them carefully, they're actually different in texture. Just in case you've ever wondered why, the textured side is for applying makeup, and the even side is for removing it. Bookworms, this one is for you. Dust jackets that come with a lot of hardcover books are not just meant to make your book look pretty, they also double as a bookmark. Just fold the pages you've already read underneath the inside of the jacket, and voila! Next time you reach out for your favorite shirt, take a look at the top buttonhole. It should be stitched horizontally, and all the other ones are vertical. Turns out that the dress shirt was designed this way, since the first and the last buttons were the first ones to unbutton throughout the day. They then changed the direction of the buttonhole to ensure the shirt would stay nice and fitted before you're ready to take it off. These days we have so many variations of this awesome dessert that it's hard to imagine we've ever lived without it. You can find different types of cookie dough ice cream or even chocolate chip cookie cake basically everywhere, but the famous cookie wasn't actually invented until 1930.
The story goes that a woman named Ruth Graves Wakefield was preparing some chocolate cookies as she was waiting for some guests to arrive. She soon figured out she was out of baker's chocolate, a crucial ingredient for the classic cookies. To fix things up, she chopped up a block of semi-sweet chocolate, thinking it would eventually spread out evenly throughout the batter, given the heat of the oven. Things didn't necessarily go as planned. But hey, it's great they didn't because this is how she invented this modern dessert we now can't get enough of. And speaking of popular snacks, the potato chip is even younger than the chocolate chip cookie. Well, at least historically. There are many stories trying to explain how it was invented. One of them goes like this. A chef named George Crum, based in New York, put the chips together in 1953. He decided to try a different cooking solution when one of his customers didn't have nice things to say about his french fries. He said they were too thick and kind of mushy. Then, Crum came up with potatoes that were thinly sliced and fried until brown. People absolutely loved the dish, and they welcomed the first ever batch of chips with open arms. Ice cream, anyone? If the story is true, back in 1904 at the St. Louis World's Fair, one ice cream shop owner ran out of cups to serve his dish. So, he fashioned a waffle into the shape of a cone, and the rest was history. Okay, I'll admit it, chewing gum-like treats have been around since the ancient Greeks. So this one isn't particularly a revolutionary discovery, but the actual gum we buy today wasn't there until the late 1800s. An American inventor named Thomas Adams wanted to mix together different chemicals to create rubber. He tried and failed, for that matter, to play with chicle for his experiment, but ended up fashioning this neat treat. They still use chicle to this day to produce most chewing gums. Back in the 1800s, there lived a man named Jean-Baptiste Joly, who worked in the fabric industry as a textile maker. How he came up with this next invention that we use a lot these days has less to do with him and more to do with his maid. The story goes that the woman accidentally knocked a kerosene lamp over onto a tablecloth. Instead of getting upset over the damaged fabric, Jolly noticed that the substance actually made the material cleaner. Figured it out yet? Yep, that's how the idea for the very first dry cleaner popped up. A very neat accident, if I do say so myself. Now this one I loved. Did you know matchsticks were initially called friction lights? Or at least that's how their inventor, a chemist named John Walker, called them back in 1826. He scraped a stick coated in chemicals across his hearth, totally by accident one day, and realized that they ignited and created a spark. Initially made out of cardboard, they were then made using wooden splints and sandpaper. Back in the 1940s, a man named Harry Coover stumbled upon a chemical formulation that seemed to stick to everything it touched. The scientific community at the time didn't look much into it as the formula didn't seem to have many applications back then. It wasn't until 1951 that he looked a bit more into the formula and decided to repurpose it. Along with a fellow Eastman Kodak researcher named Fred Joyner, they gave it a proper full name. But you must know it by the shorter version, Super Glue. It also has many uses in security these days that it's hard to believe that we didn't come up with this one on purpose. Back in 1903, a scientist named Edward Benedictus knocked over a flask by accident. He looked down and was amazed to see that the glassware had just slightly cracked but maintained its shape. He was expecting it to break into a million tiny pieces. Curious about this hidden feature, he looked into it and figured out what was keeping the glass together was a substance coating the inside of the glass. Ta-da! That's how humanity came up with safety glass. There's nothing better than a nice piece of buttered toast for breakfast, if we're not counting hot fudge sundaes. But if you find it harder to spread out cold butter over your toast, here's an idea. Use a cheese grater. Figure out the amount you need and grate the product. The process will also soften the butter, making it easier to spread, and you won't have to melt a too large amount of it in the process. But still, that hot fudge. Dried pasta comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes for a reason. That's because each type of pasta goes best with a particular sauce. Pasta shells, for example, are perfect with denser and chunkier sauces. Why? because the sauce gets inside the shells, making it easier to serve and eat the dish. The ribbed outer surface also helps with covering the shells in the sauce. If you ever end up burning your cookies, ow! 
you can save them with your trusty grater, too. Just grate off the blackened parts after carefully taking the cookies from the baking tray. But be careful and wait until the cookies have cooled down. Also, if you ruin their shape a bit, you can always dip them in some melted chocolate. Ooh. After the chocolate cools down, you'll have perfectly shaped cookies. Although, after it gets past your lips and beyond, does the shape of the cookie actually matter? Mm, just saying. If you like adding a lot of ingredients to your sandwiches, but don't really appreciate it when the bread gets soggy, there is a way to reduce the amount of moisture. Pick your sliced tomatoes or cucumbers and place them between two paper towels for up to 5 minutes. After that, you can use them. Also, make sure to spread butter, cheese, or sauces, like mayo or ketchup, onto the bread first. This will help you seal the bread and keep moisture at bay. Some people think that the little white string that you find near an egg yolk needs to be removed before you cook the egg. Well, I'm here to tell you that these strands are called calaza, and you don't actually need to get rid of them. They help keep the yolk in place at the egg center. A calaza is not going to mess up the consistency or the taste of your food, so removing it is completely up to you. Ever notice that most juice boxes come with two flaps, one on each side? Those are actually handles. Manufacturers design the boxes this way to make it easier for us to hold them. This way, we don't end up squeezing the box, making the juice spill out. Now, you don't need to be a baking pro to know that you can use both white and brown sugar in your recipes. But have you ever wondered what the difference between these two is? It turns out that the only thing that sets them apart is that, during production, a small amount of molasses is added to the brown sugar. Molasses is basically a sort of syrup you get when processing sugarcane. It's usually removed during the refining process. That's how white sugar is produced. But if some amount of molasses remains in the final product, we end up with brown sugar, with its specific taste and darker hue. It's a good thing. There are a lot of things you can put in your dishwasher apart from your dishes. For example, you can clean such things as your silicone oven mitts or the knobs of some kitchen appliances, like your oven or stove. Some kitchen sponges and reusable towels may be safe to clean in the dishwasher as well. Speaking of kitchen cleaning products, there are a lot of things you can do with dish soap, like degriming your patio furniture. Just add a bit of dish detergent to some warm water and use the solution to wipe down your outdoor furniture with a piece of cloth. Finally, rinse it clean using your garden hose. You can also use dish soap to get rid of greasy stains on your clothes. Be it pasta sauce or salad dressings, hey, sometimes we miss our mouths. So just apply a little dish detergent to the stain and then rinse with water. Use non-colored soap for lighter clothes. For more difficult stains, let the dish soap sink in for a bit, then throw the piece of clothing in the washer as usual. And think about maybe getting a bib. If none of the methods have helped you organize your closet and you're still overwhelmed with large piles of clothes, there's a simple way that might be effective. It's called the one-in, one-out rule. That means for every new piece of clothing you buy, you need to get rid of one you already have. That means you'll always be decluttering your space. To make it easier to find something in your closet, good luck, keep your most used items at eye level. This way, they'll be easier to find and pull out when you're in a hurry. Those items that you tend to use less often, like your evening clothes, for example, can stay on the shelves above or below your eye level. You can make good use of old spice tins. If you glue some powerful magnets to the inside of the tins, they can double as magnetic shelves. You can use them for all sorts of everyday items, like kitchen pliers, ice cream scoops, mm, or even cutlery. You can also place them on any metallic surface, like your refrigerator door. They'll blend in nicely with your kitchen magnets. Hidden in your laundry room, there's a great tool for picking up pet hair. It sometimes works better than lint rollers. Take a dryer sheet and, using some elbow grease, you'll get rid of that dog or cat hair in no time. It works on all sorts of surfaces, but it's especially effective for upholstered furniture. Now, if you don't like it when a door starts squeaking whenever you enter a room, get a bar of soap and rub it straight on the hinges. This will only help for a while, though. 
But it'll do the trick until you manage to get to a hardware store and, you know, buy some oil. Have you ever noticed that in some elevators, there's a star next to the number of a specific floor? No, it's not to indicate where my office is. (laughs) It's there to point out where the nearest exit is. And it's not always on the first floor. It's most likely located on the floor closest to the street. Have you ever wondered why stop signs are red? Well, back in the day, they didn't actually have any particular color at all. Before the 1920s, they didn't even have a standardized shape. In 1922, though, someone came up with the octagon. But initially, it was painted yellow. All because the red coloring tended to fade out too quickly because of sun exposure. So yellow turned out to be the best option. It took another 30 years for fade-resistant enamel paint to be invented. We ended up changing the color of the stop sign back to red. After all, it's still the best color if you want something to be easily noticeable. Do you know there's a type of rose that can grow taller than people? According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the tallest rose bush ever found grew in Vienna, Austria. It was a staggering 28 and a half feet tall. Yes, it arose to a great height. In the same way we all have unique patterns on our fingerprints, no two tigers have the same set of stripes. It makes it easier for people working with this feline species to distinguish one tiger from another. I'll bet you didn't know the White House has its own flower shop hidden in the basement of the building. It's supposed to provide flower arrangements for all sorts of events that take place there. It's probably no surprise that pizza has become an American staple dish despite its Italian origin. People in the U.S. love it so much that they buy 350 slices of pizza every second in the States. Man, I'm not getting my fair share. To manage the huge demand for this delicious dish, around 17% of all restaurants in the U.S. are pizzerias. Finally, there's a way to make lemon juice without the seeds getting into your beverage. Try cutting the fruit in two and squeezing it with a pair of kitchen tongs. The pointed end of the lemon should be facing down. The juice will flow down, but the seeds will remain inside the lemon. Ooh, lemonade. It goes well with pizza. Various types of cheese have holes for a reason. For example, Swiss cheese is made with special bacteria that produce carbon dioxide. As the CO2 is emitted, it blows like bubblegum, leaving tiny craters, also known as cheese eyes. Then the cheese is cooled down, but the holes stay in place. Over 40 billion Oreos are made every single year. It's the world's most popular manufactured cookie. The geometric design stamped onto these cookies has the Nabisco logo, the symbol of European quality, surrounding the word Oreo. William Turnier created the chocolate cookie design we see today back in 1952. If you use reusable bottles, you probably know that sometimes they smell. Even if you only use it for regular water, it still smells. But it's not the water that smells, it's the microorganisms in it. If you drink water from a bottle, the particles of your saliva and sweat stay in there. Those bacteria start to build up in the bottle, causing the smell. So, if you choose reusable bottles, make sure to wash them every day to prevent those bacteria from building up. After washing, let it dry completely before using it again. Not only are the jeans blue, but the police officers' uniforms as well. The first official police officers appeared in the 19th century in London. They were given a blue uniform to contrast with the red and white uniform that military workers had already been wearing. Two decades afterward, the police force was adopted in the USA, and they followed the patterns. The uniform is still blue nowadays because it proved to be a good color. It's not that visible in dark hours, and police officers can observe things and people staying unnoticed. Also, stains aren't that visible on dark material. And, well, everyone knows that police officers wear blue and they're recognized it. So, why change that? Baby carrots are tiny, and unlike regular carrots, wet. Not unlike baby humans. Baby carrots aren't some special sort of carrot. They're actually made of regular carrots by cutting off the skin and outer layers and then polishing them to look that pretty. 
The problem is, they can't retain moisture. A regular carrot retains some water inside because of the layers that lock it in. Once they're chopped out, baby carrots can dry out easily. So they usually sell them in bags with some water inside. Jeans have metal rivets, and they're there from the very beginning. Jacob Davis, the man who made the first pair of jeans, added copper rivets to spots where pants are more likely to rip, flies and pockets, to make them stronger. Today, they have more of a decorative purpose, since they are distinctive and traditional for jeans. Another special thing about jeans is those tiny pockets they have that seemingly serve no purpose. Well, maybe it's true now. But years ago, when many cowboys were wearing jeans, the pocket was made specifically to keep a pocket watch there. Also, back then, a pair of jeans had just four pockets. That tiny pocket, the watch pocket, two big pockets in front, and just one pocket in the back. Car headrests are all about comfort, and detachable headrests are all about safety. If you pull the headrest out, you'll see two sturdy metal bars. If you ever get locked or trapped in a car, you can use the bars to smash the window and get out. Those little red spots you sometimes see after you crack an egg are nothing to be worried about. Tiny blood spots can be caused by a small rupture in a blood vessel of a hen as it was laying the egg. Eggs with these blood spots are safe to eat, but that spot can be removed if you want. It won't affect the taste of the egg. Oh, that's comforting. Hidden within the Toblerone logo of the mountain is the image of a bear standing on its hind legs, about to eat that yodeler over there. No, not really. This is because bears are a big part of Bern, one of the biggest cities in Switzerland where the founder created the triangular chocolate tree. Toblerone is also a play on the founder's family name, Tobler, and the Italian word Torone for honey and almond nougat. The space below a cup of noodles is there to protect the noodles during transport. This technique is called a middle suspension. Not only are they protected better in their styrofoam cup, but it also helps those noodles soften more evenly and quickly. Even though you might have noticed that the hole on the barrel of ballpoint pens has no purpose, it does. It's called a venting system, which helps the ink flow more smoothly. This way, an even amount of air pressure is created inside and outside the pen, allowing the ink to flow into the point easily. It's not an accident that soy sauce bottles have two spouts. The sauce is liquid, and it flows out of the bottle pretty quickly once you turn it over. Most Asian food lovers will admit they've spilled it at least once in a lifetime. That's why, nowadays, restaurants prefer serving soy sauce in special bottles that have two spouts. This design allows you to control when and how much sauce will come out. Just put your finger on one spout while you pour the sauce through another. If you press your finger tightly to the spout, the sauce will stop flowing, and if you remove your finger, it will flow again. And please do not remove your finger in a restaurant. It will freak everybody out. You've probably noticed that train and bus seats are covered in fabrics with weird patterns. Any idea why? They use these patterns to cover any germs and stains on the seat. Oh boy! The brighter the color and the more patterned it is, the harder it will be for a passenger to notice any stains and get grossed out. Also, the patterns are usually so ugly that no one even wants to look at them for long enough to spot any stains. So yeah, the pattern is there to make you look away. And if you look, to make it less noticeable. No bus will ever have plain white seats. That's a guarantee. The middle tab on soda cans can be flipped around. You can slip a straw in place so you don't have to hold it up your mouth. This stay-on tab replaced the pull ring tab created in the early 60s. You remember those, don't you? Those could be quite sharp and easily discarded where they could be a menace for others. Now you can pop your straw straight into one. Also means you can produce some bubbles and make a mess like a 3-year-old. Sometimes, when you purchase an article of clothing, you receive a plastic baggie with an extra button and a swatch of fabric. While the fabric is clearly used to patch holes, it can also be used to test the effects of various cleaners on certain surfaces. It's handy, too, to test wash cycles before using them to wash the whole garment. Escalators have those fluffy black brushes for a similar reason that some have yellow lines on their steps. 
to try and deter people from getting too close to dangerous places. People don't always take notice, and sometimes clothing can drape close to the point where the step meets the edge or skirt. The brush is a little barrier to help prevent this from happening. They can also catch bits of fluff and prevent other small things from falling down into the gaps. Those takeaway containers most associated with Chinese restaurants are designed to not only carry your food home, but to store it in the fridge. They double as a plate, as you can eat straight out of them and don't have to worry about dirty dishes. Yay! They were actually patented way back in 1894 to transport freshly shucked oysters and were known as oyster pails. They were later adapted to use as leak-proof containers for food. Ever wondered why coins have those little ridges along the edge? It's a leftover from earlier times when they were worth more. Counterfeiters could easily file the edges off to sell as gold or silver coins to make some profit. The ridges were created so it was much easier to tell which of the coins had been altered. It's not needed today, but the coins still have that altered style. All crackers and some cookies have holes to make sure the final product has the right texture. These teeny tiny holes allow steam to escape, so your crackers and cookies won't snap. If it weren't for these holes, also known as dockers, steam would build up inside the treat, and the final result might have been scrumptious, but it would have been rather oddly shaped. Dogs like to walk in circles before snoozing because they inherited this behavior pattern from their ancestors. There were no special doggy beds back then, so most pooches would have to push down tall grass to make a sort of snoozing spot. Plus, as a bonus, those movements scared off all the critters lurking in the vegetation. Donuts are ring-shaped for a similar reason. If they hadn't had holes right in the center, the dough there would have always been undercooked. By the way, they're often associated with the police, because back in the 1950s, donut shops were among the only places open late. They were a perfect place for police officers to grab something to eat and even deal with some paperwork during the night shift. Your jeans are blue on the outside and white on the inside because of a smart way to weave the fabric. The warp thread is dyed, while the weft thread has no color. It's just white. This way, manufacturers reduce the amount of dye needed for each piece of clothing. And they're still dyeing to make the jeans. You just spent the entire morning running errands up and down the street, and you finally stopped to treat yourself to a cup of coffee. You enter the nearest coffee shop, place your order, and notice that actually, you really need to use the bathroom. It's a regular-looking public one with multiple stalls. As you pick yours, the one in the middle, you get inside and your mind starts to wander. Why on earth do bathroom doors have a half-inch gap between the door and the lock? And why on earth do they have a huge gap between the door and the floor? Can we have a drum roll for this moment, please? Well, my friend, there is not only one specific reason why public bathroom doors have so many gaps in them, but rather several. Public toilets are designed to make people spend as little time there as possible. You aren't supposed to feel comfortable or at home. So the design would have to reflect this notion. Here come the gaps. In some bathrooms, gaps are so big that users may even feel self-conscious about doing their business out of preoccupation that the rest of the people standing in line will see them. Then there's the matter of pricing. Making custom doors can be a heavy burden for the people building public toilets. This would mean understanding exact measurements so that doors would always fit the mold of the stalls it's supposed to be installed into. Now, not all the gaps in public bathrooms are necessarily the same size. They may vary, even if this variation is small and often unnoticeable. So these gaps actually help to reduce the margins of errors and to turn production more cost-effective for the people financing them. In case a door comes wider or more narrow than it should, the gap regulates the differences and allows for their installation anyway. There is also the case of air circulation. The last thing you want to do in a public bathroom is to trap odors. So you need a little space under and between the doors to allow the air to flow. Finally, the gaps are a big safety measure. It can always allow for people on the outside to see if someone inside a stall isn't feeling too okay and maybe needs some help. 
And what about that extra hole in the upper part of the sink? It has a name and everything. The overflow hole. And it's designed to keep the sink from flooding. So, in case someone forgets and keeps the faucet going for too long, or the sink gets clogged and water can't drain down from the main drain hole, the overflow hole comes in to save the day. Let's say it buys you a little time before you have the entire bathroom floor flooded. Have you ever noticed how satisfying closing the door of a car can be? Car manufacturers devote a great deal of time to designing these sounds. Studies have shown that they create a perceived sense of quality in the buyer. It all begins with the primary material. While older cars used to be made with heavier materials, car doors nowadays are produced with lighter tin, which can make a rather unpleasant metallic sound once you shut them closed. So car companies employ sound engineers to ensure that there is the exact amount of foam, mats, and tin in a car's composition to make the most comforting sound possible. And what about those tiny dots on the top of your car's front window? The pattern of these little black dots minimizes distractions for your eyes. This black part, also known as frit, normally gets warmer than the clear parts, which prevents the windshield from deforming. And no, the tab under your rearview mirror is not made only for the purpose of hanging fluffy dice or aromatic-pleasing air fresheners. It's actually a switch that allows you to adjust the position of the mirror, depending on the time of day. Flip it one way, and it's the daytime driving mode. Flip the other, and you're ready to drive safely during nighttime as it tones down the glare coming from headlights of the cars behind you. Next time you head out to the supermarket, make sure to keep this in mind. In case you don't have a coin to unlock these shopping carts, there is a well-kept secret that can help you out. If you have your house keys on you, check for a rounded key head. If you happen to find one, try using it to unlock the cart. It should fit perfectly in there, replacing the need to carry coins around. Because, if we're being honest, who still has them? Elevators. If you want to ride them on your terms, and your terms only, make sure to try something out. Most elevators have a secret button combination you can use to skip all the other selected floors and go directly to the one of your choosing. This might work out, especially on those days when you press 13. But you wanted to press 33. On most elevators, this works once you simultaneously press the closed door button together with your floor number. This should help you get to your floor without stopping. Some elevators require you to double press the selected floor numbers, as double pressing will often cancel the previously made request. While other elevators require you to hold the open door button and then double press the buttons of the floors you'd like to cancel. Now, to stay out of trouble, it's best not to cancel the floors of the other people in the elevator. They won't take it kindly. Also keep in mind that there are elevators that might not have this function. Now, for honey lovers out there, go ahead and raise your hand. If your pot of golden honey is crystallized, know that it is actually a good sign. Crystallized honey means that it hasn't been pasteurized, which means better product quality. With a decrease in temperature, the natural ingredient of honey, also known as glucose, will make it crystallize. Now, try making the best of it. To add some texture to your oatmeal or toast, add a layer of crystallized honey and enjoy nature's sugar. And if you don't like crystallized honey, plop it in the microwave for a minute or two. Ah, winter and fall. You know what this means, right? Sweater weather. But there's nothing more annoying than wearing your beautiful wool sweater and itching yourself all the way through it. Actually, I can be more annoying than that, but let's talk about itchy sweaters. To keep this from happening again, here's the secret. Turn your sweater inside out and soak it in cold water. Add 2 or 3 tablespoons of vinegar and let it sit for a while. Then, drain the water. Now, while the sweater is still wet, massage a generous amount of hair conditioner into the fibers of the wool. After letting it soak in the hair conditioner for about 30 minutes, gently press the excess water out of the wool and leave it to dry flat on a towel. There you go! No more itchy sweater! Any fast food restaurant you go to will hand out small paper cups for customers to fill with their ketchup, mustard, or barbecue sauce. But if you're eating some chicken nuggets or trying to dip your burger into the cup, there's always that bit of sauce that seems impossible to reach. Next time, try unfolding the cup. It'll turn into a small paper plate, and this way, you'll get all the ketchup you poured in the first place. Padlocks used in outdoor environments should be clean and lubricated every three months. 
Regular lubrication will help prevent padlocks from freezing in cold weather conditions. Look for the tiny hole on the bottom of the lock. Then pour oil into it, and there you go! It opens again. One thing we often neglect is a point in an ointment cap. These pointy surfaces were designed to help us break the tinfoil protection of the ointment tube. You just turn the cap over and break the ointment seal with its own cap, and there you go. After a long day of work, all you really need to do is a bubble bath. You turn on the hot water and let it run for a few minutes. You might even light a candle and pour some essential oils into the water. Then, in comes the liquid soap. You stir the water until the entire surface of the tub water is crammed with bubbles and make your way in. The bubbles in a bubble bath have a fundamental primary function. Their job is to preserve the water's temperature, just so you can have warm water for longer. Do you have sweaty feet? Weird question, I know. But if you're one of these people, here's some good news. All is not lost. Try putting a dry tea bag inside your shoes and storing it in a dry place for a while. The tea bags will absorb the humidity and the smell off the soles of your shoes. So here I am thinking, shouldn't we have learned these things in school? Well, either way, if you learned something new today, make sure to tell us about it in the comments below. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your